Behind This Door, a plan for Detroit's future. These men are designing and engineering the Great Lakes Connecting Channels project, a plan to deepen those stretches of water that tie together one of the largest inland waterways in the world. They're plotting the groundwork for a project that will allow deep draft vessels, both lake and ocean going, to pass swiftly and easily from Lake Erie to Detroit, to Chicago and Milwaukee, and on to Duluth at the western end of Lake Superior. The project will span five years and cost a vast $136 million, but well worth the time and money for the vitality and economic strength it will bring to the industrial heart of America, to our own city of Detroit. First step in the project is to deepen 32 miles of the Detroit River to a maximum depth of 29 feet. Planning for this initial phase required years of study. Now that work has begun, United States Army District Engineer Colonel Peter C. Heiser and his staff are kept busy checking and supervising construction details and letting out contracts for dredging operations. Downriver at Amherstburg, Ontario, the resident engineer serves as the Corps of Engineers supervisor for the operation. Private contractors are doing the actual dredging and construction work. Problems encountered are worked out with the aid of the resident engineer, whose broad background in projects of this magnitude assures a proper solution. The combined experience of the United States Army Corps of Engineers and qualified civilian contractors keeps the work flowing without interruption. In dredging the Amherstburg Channel, high explosives are used continually. A seismograph records each blast to control shock intensities within safe limits. The entire Connecting Channels project calls for the excavation of 44 million cubic yards of earth and rock by the largest, most varied fleet of dredging equipment ever assembled. The Detroit River phase employs a steam-operated drill boat for blasting rock. Four drills, housed in towering shafts, bore into the riverbed, making way for placement of the explosive charges. Towed safely behind the drill boat, a one-day's supply of dynamite keeps explosive experts busy day and night. Controlled work schedules permit giant lake freighters to continue their normal shipping routine. Range markers permit plant alignment, so the dredges can move right in for excavation of loosened rock and earth. The 700-ton dredge Mogul, manned by a crew of 32, works round the clock, deepening the Detroit River, for use not only by the newest and largest type of lake freighter, but also to accommodate ocean-going vessels, sailing to and from the markets of the world through the St. Lawrence Seaway. Each time the bucket dips under the surface, it reappears with 12 cubic yards of river bottom, slowly increasing the water's depth from 21 to 28 feet. Great barges bearing capacity loads of nearly 1,600 cubic yards are towed to dumping areas by the tugboat Atomic, plying the river's length 24 hours a day. A second drill boat of the newest design is performing its very first job on the Detroit River phase of the Connecting Channels project, its battery of compressed air drills making quick work of dynamiting. Deepening of the Great Lakes connecting channels is a tremendous undertaking. Realizing the 300-year-old dream of Michigan and the city of Detroit to gain full potential from the endless supply of navigable water given us by nature. The lakes are already deep enough, but deepening of the channels between will mean increased trade to and from Detroit, with more vessels calling at our waterfront, their larger capacities permitting cheaper transportation costs bolstering our economy with a freer flow of goods. Each box of explosives, each bite of the drill into the riverbed, signifies another step toward making our town attractive to new industry, desirable as a good place to live and raise a family. 24 times a day, six days a week, controlled blasting goes on. 
carving from the familiar river a new pattern for future growth in Detroit. Our neighbors in Canada, who will share with us the benefits of increased Great Lakes traffic, joined with government officials, visiting dignitaries and residents of the Great Lakes region on May 28, 1957, to celebrate inauguration of the Connecting Channels project. With a beautiful day, the signal for a festive occasion, a large group of Detroiters gathered with a contingent of honored guests for the trip downriver to Amherstburg and Boblo Island. A rousing march tune from the Detroit Police Band, carried along on a light spring breeze, heralded an event of international significance. Representatives from all Great Lakes ports were on hand for the sailing. Civic leaders anxious to see the start of the project that promises to change the face of their cities. With everyone aboard, the trip got underway. Away from the Detroit of today, toward the Detroit of tomorrow. Our impressive skyline, a fitting backdrop for the events of this important day. Most of the sites familiar to our town won't change with completion of the project, but the fiber of our life will find renewed strength and vigor with the coming of increased shipping activity. Deeper channels between the Great Lakes will permit capacity use of the larger vessels now being built to serve industry and commerce in the region. Their increased cargoes will lessen costs, and these savings will be passed on to private manufacturers and merchants already operating on the lakes and those who will move in, attracted by the ease and economy of water transportation. When the entire project is finished, ships will take Detroit-made goods through the St. Lawrence Seaway to European markets, while bringing vital raw materials from the Midwest, Louisiana, and Texas by way of the Mississippi navigational system. This day, the 28th of May, 1957, signaled the birth of a great new waterway stretching from Canada and the Atlantic Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico, with Detroit a main stop on the route. Excitement soared high as Amherstburg came into view, our Canadian friends out to welcome guests to the inauguration site. Ceremonies took place offshore on Boblo Island, near the spot where the first charge of dynamite would be set off, beginning dredging operations on the channel. Passengers hurried off to join the celebration. Americans and Canadians working toward a common goal, strengthening the positions of their two great nations in a competitive world. The Royal Mounted and the Detroit Police Band made a colorful, stirring sight Out on the water, scores of small craft took part in an exciting river parade, a salute to the channel's project. Back on shore, guests took their places before the stand, met old friends, and discussed the bright future this day would bring forth. Dignitaries, civic-minded businessmen, and government officials eagerly awaited the dedication, while others enjoyed picturesque activities. And then the invocation, given by Monsignor Edward J. Hickey, an earnest prayer that the work be guided in the right direction and used for constructive purposes. The proceedings were recorded for all to see. With respect to governments on both sides of the international border, the crowd rose to hear O Canada and the Star Spangled Banner. Chairman Walker L. Sisler opened the proceedings. Introductions were made by Robert L. Biggers, member of the Executive Committee. 
Official welcome was offered by Honorable Paul J. J. Martin, Canadian Minister of Health and Welfare. Details of the project were furnished by Major General Emerson C. Itchner, Chief of Engineers, United States Army. His Excellency J. H. Van Royen, Netherlands Ambassador to the United States, remarked on the international nature of the event. Spiritual blessing was given the ceremony by Reverend M. C. Davies. At the end of an hour of addresses, Secretary of the Army Honorable Wilbur M. Brucker underscored the importance of the project for continued economic strength. Finally, the big moment, the explosive set. All eyes turned on the river, and the charge was detonated. The first step toward improvement of the world's largest inland waterway system. The planning is completed. The ceremonies are over. The work begun. The result will be a new breath of life for the Great Lakes region, a rich, eventful future for industry and business, and the start of a great economic adventure for our own city of Detroit. As Detroit advances its position in the community of great American cities, its industry advances too, through the manufacture of better products, through larger volume, through the development of products more economical to buy and maintain. And most important of all, through wide diversification, the manufacture of many different kinds of useful products. In many cases, one Detroit industry helps another, the end product being the result of several specialized operations, each contributing its own particular skill to the creation of one final product. A leader in this kind of industrial teamwork is the Mardigan Corporation, which since 1945 has become one of the nation's largest, most respected tool and die manufacturers. The growth of the Mardigan Corporation is an American success story in the true sense. Its prominence today as a dependable servant of industry stems from the daring, the imagination of its founder, Edward Mardigan, who brought his native skill for engineering to America when only a small boy and went on to a career of manufacturing quality tooling and helping other industrialists fill their need for tools and dyes. Dies can be designed to stamp out an automobile fender for one of Detroit's famed motor companies, or to form the contours of Mardigan's own line of cooking utensils and household appliances. Such versatility requires the skill of experienced engineers who work from exact specifications to calculate the shape and dimensions of the tool or die. Following the work of the engineer, draftsmen make up drawings to guide die makers in the many steps necessary to the production of quality dies. Sometimes the customer will supply a wood model of the finished part. In other cases, the plant's pattern and model shop builds the model to precise measurement. The men who work in the pattern shop are skilled tradesmen. They've been in the business for many years and have a complete understanding of their work and know the importance of absolute accuracy. Models produced in this department give the designers and engineers a graphic three-dimensional picture of just how the finished part will look and tell them how the die must be made in order to achieve the correct size and contours in the finished product. All kinds of controls are employed to see that every dimension, every shape, is precision formed to the closest tolerances. Among these is a plastic skin, which takes on the exact form of the finished part. After careful molding of the skin, it's coated with a special plastic to produce rigidity. The skin is actually a plastic replica of the finished part, and later on, when the die is completed, this skin will tell engineers if the customer's specifications have been accurately met. Plastic as well as wood is used for models of finished parts. 
And when the plastic model for an automobile fender is matched to the plastic skin, it's easy to see that the ultimate in precision work is performed in the Mardigan pattern shop. Each detail is checked to see that the model conforms to every specification. With the pattern completed to the engineer's satisfaction, skilled foundrymen take over to shape molten metal into the desired form. A green sand mold is constructed from the pattern and filled with steel alloy, a combination of metals designed to give utmost strength and durability to the finished die. The foundry does its part of the job spectacularly. But behind the blaze of sparks and the dazzling glow of molten steel pouring into the cupola stands the Mardigan trademark, precision. For here again, the work is marked by accuracy. The metal formula prepared perfectly, the temperature is just right so that the casting will set properly with all its desired strength intact. Now layout men, following the instructions of the blueprint, carefully prepare the casting for machining. For well, this piece of metal from the foundry is a rough casting, bearing only the relative dimensions and shapes needed to produce a perfect finished part. Its lines must be refined and smoothed by planing, milling, shaping, and coloring. With the casting clearly marked by layout men, operators of giant planers go to work to level off the huge base. The highly skilled machinist watches over his planer's automatic controls, seeing that everything works properly, making sure that each casting completes the operation with just the right amount of excess metal shaved from its base. The combination of men and machinery assures accuracy. The areas smoothed by machining operations will receive steel inserts designed to form, trim, and pierce various sections of the part to be stamped out on the die. Each machine has its own particular job to perform. Cutters, drills, and grinding wheels, machining the metal down to close tolerances. Now the complex form of the die begins to emerge. The carefully thought out plans of the engineering staff are nearing reality as delicately balanced machine tools take over. Every advance in machine tool design is employed by the Mardigan Corporation. Only with the newest methods and equipment can the company meet the demands of its customers to produce quality dies and tools for the manufacture in mass numbers of automobile parts, stove parts, sinks, bathtubs, and many other products. Boring mills with varying capacities permit the undertaking of a wide range of tooling jobs. With sufficient milling machines, lathes, kellers, planers, grinders, and other essential machine tools, the company's two Detroit plants are able to handle contracts both large and small, simple and complex, while meeting immediate and long-range delivery schedules. A fine example of modern progress in the field of tool and die making is the kellering operation. Many of these giant machines are in constant use molding and shaping the die to precision contours impossible to achieve by any other method. The size of the keller nearly dwarfs its operator, but his skill and experience make him the master, the machine, the well-trained servant. The plaster pattern acts as a guide for the tracer, which feels out the contours of the pattern. The cutting tool automatically duplicates the tensions of the tracer, reproducing the pattern's contours in the metal die. by a special liquid, the cutting tool eats away at the metal. Preset controls and the watchful eye of the operator seeing the operation through to a success. Mm. 
Many of the specialists who work at Mardigan have moved up from the company's extensive apprentice program. At almost any time of the year, about 40 young men from the Detroit area can be found here, learning the skills of the tool and die industry. It's a long process, taking nearly four years to complete. But the men who undergo this training are among the best tool and die men in the nation. The combination of working and learning under the supervision of experts allows the apprentice a rare opportunity to understand fully the practical application of his trade. One day, the apprentice will be a qualified die maker, performing the important job of assembling the die's component parts. At this point, knowing hands assume responsibility. Trained eyes determine the fit of one part to another. In the assembly stage, the mating parts of the die are perfectly matched and fitted to each other. The parts are placed carefully together. The smallest discrepancy calls for more work on the part. The steady action of a hand-operated grinder smooths out remaining high spots. Constant care of this sort and immediate correction of any irregularities make for the highest kind of precision in the finished die. The die maker never relaxes his sharp eye, his experienced hand, in meeting the standards set by the customer and the standards set by the Mardigan Corporation. Hand finishing is applied to the punch, the part of a die that actually shapes sheet metal to required specifications. Hand craftsmanship is all important at this stage of production, for here the most minute distortions are felt by experienced hands. Now the die is spotted or fitted in a special press designed for that purpose. Here workmen rely on bluing to point out any high spots. And again, a hand-operated grinder matches the surfaces. Several tries are made. Each time bluing is left on the die, grinding is resumed until every high spot is removed, assuring perfect fit. The punch has finally reached the customer's specifications and has been mated with the die. But before it can be released for shipment, the assembled die must be tested under actual operating conditions. A steel panel is placed in the die which has been mounted in a tryout press. The press lowers and all the painstaking work that has gone before will be carefully evaluated. Again, bluing helps the workman determine which areas need still more finishing and additional grinding brings the die one step nearer completion. A series of tests are made on tryout presses similar to presses the customer will use in his manufacturing process. Each tryout hit is followed by necessary corrections for proper fits and clearances. Finally, the last tryout. All crimps, thin spots, the improper flow of metal have been corrected. The die receives a panel of steel and under hundreds of thousands of pounds of pressure, the panel is produced. The reputation of the company, of the engineers, the machinists, the tool and die makers, rests on the finished die. Their concern for its accuracy calls for inspection after inspection until its action is perfect. The finished stamping tells the story. Carefully measured and gauged with delicate instruments, compared with the original wood or plastic model, its precision is the final indication of the precision of the die.
Approval is given only when skilled craftsmen know that everything is in order. Their OK is the customer's assurance of efficiency and dependability. Many Mardigan dies are designed to do big jobs, and their size and weight demand movement by giant overhead cranes, some dies weighing 40 tons. Deposited by the crane on an electric lift truck that plant personnel call Big Bertha, the die is moved easily and quickly to the shipping area. 20 tons of automotive stamping die on its way to bolster production in one of the nation's great automobile manufacturing plants. As industry here in Detroit, in other parts of the country, even in foreign lands, calls for more and better tool and die equipment, facilities at Mardigan will meet the call. Methods will advance to fill specific requirements. Yes, in homes in every city and hamlet, in the air and along the highways, useful products made with the help of Mardigan Corporation tools and dies will continue to afford better living for all to display the industrial might of Detroit to the world.